Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. Welcome back to another episode of Mail Bonding, the podcast where we look back at the films of the James Bond 007 series and review them to see how how they stand up to our criticism sometimes three or four decades after their release. I'm Patrick, and with me, as always, are two uh, are supposedly two resident James Bond experts. First, he's the author of Duty, Honor, Empire, a 25th century love story, Chris Haley. Hey, what's up? Not much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have anything funny. I, I was Obviously, I didn't either because I wrote nothing clever for your name this time. Uh, so. l- let me see if I can think of something really quick. Uh, uh, no, I got yeah, nothing. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I've got nothing. <laughs> Finally, the youngest member of our group and our resident half man, Matt Palmer. Hey, I bit my golden gun. Turns out it's tungsten. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Much better. Way, way, way above the heads of most people listening to this podcast. (laughs) And if you haven't figured it out yet, uh, this week we're reviewing 1974's The Man with the Golden Gun, uh, the second outing for Roger Moore as James Bond and the ninth in the official series. Uh, And Matt, usually you have a summary for us, so hopefully you can summarize said film. Yeah, and you know, off the air, this summer is crap, but it's what I got right now. <laughs> All right. Matt, uh, share the summary with us. Can you tell me a story? Francisco Scaramanga is an assassin with a golden gun, a private island, and a strong desire to kill James Bond. He practices killing Bond by shooting other assassins in a fun house on his private island with his midget named Nick Nick. Scaramanga sends a golden bullet to MI6 with... 007 etched into the surface, so M decides to pull him back to safety. Bond, however, takes matters into his own hands. Bond follows Scaramanga's woman, Andrea Anders, to where he steals the Solex Agitator, a key piece of solar technology. Bond is set up shortly after when Scaramanga kills someone walking on the street, and Bond is taken into custody and escorted to the wreckage of the Queen Mary, where MI6 has set up a secret office. On the ship, M assigns Bond to retrieve the Solex Agitator. From there, Bond heads to Bangkok to follow a lead. He poses as Scaramanga by gluing a third nipple to his chest, but is foiled since the actual Scaramanga, three nipples and all, was also staying with the shady types in Bangkok. They made Bond fight a kung fu battle, however he escapes and reunites with his assistant, Mary Goodnight. Anders sells Scaramanga out to Bond and promises him the Solex agitator if he kills her old boss. He meets her at a boxing match, but she's killed before they can seal the deal. Bond manages to track Scaramanga to his island from there. It seems Scaramanga is running an assassination, laser gun, and green energy business that he intends to sell to the highest bidder. Scaramanga challenges Bond to a pistol duel in his funhouse. He loses. Goodnight then destroys a henchman and the plant with him, escaping on Scaramanga's boat with James Bond. Yay! You're not going to even talk about Nick Knack being on the boat? I was trying to keep it under 250 words. <laughs> He was, was up two, there looking for the planes. Yeah. That was 290. All right. The Man with the Golden Gun, released on December 18th of 1974, grossed just under $21 million. It is a, currently ranked number 23 out of the 24 official James Bond films. I guess that uh, that 24 also includes uh, Never Say Never Again. I uh, finished right behind On Her Majesty's Secret Service and right in front of Dr. No. So the first film is the only film that grossed less than this. If you adjust it for inflation, it made a paltry night, just slightly over $91 million. It's still 23 out of 24 behind the living daylights and right in front of License to Kill. Uh, so the, the very low grossing uh, Timothy Dalton films. It is based off, it is the ninth official James Bond film and is based off the 13th book in the novel series, which was the last book written by Ian Fleming prior to his death. When did he die? Uh, is in the, I want to say it was 65, 66. He died very early in the film series. He was only alive for the first couple. I think, I think he got through Goldfinger, if I remember correctly, uh, like the filming of it. I don't think he actually saw the release. Oh, I thought it was Diamonds Are Forever that killed him. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, I think almost anything after, well, Thunderball on could have killed him. But uh, 
at that he point rolling in his grave <laughs> so the first three films where he was like oh this my you know my legacy is in good hands and then after that they just shit all over it so uh all right uh, we usually start by talking about the music in the films and this is chris's area of discussion and chris what about the music in this film specifically the theme and the uh, composer John Barry came back for this one, and it was kind of a rush job. He only had about uh, three weeks to score it, and subsequently uh, he felt it was – I think he felt it was his worst score, he, that he hated the score of this one. The uh, To me, though, it seemed fitting for the for where they were. It, I thought it blended in pretty well with the um, Chinese, uh, or I guess it's Hong Kong, in Macau uh, setting. So I didn't really think it was that bad of a score personally, but the, uh, the theme song, uh, which I absolutely hated was not really received very well itself. Uh, the song, um, the man with the golden gun was sung by Lulu, a popular singer of the late sixties, early seventies. And it was scored by John Barry and what I found interesting besides just her annoying voice was that it was heavy and sexual innuendo about the man with the golden gun. But really, Scaramanga in this film wasn't a very sexual person that I, that I thought. So it was kind of a disconnect between the song and the film. Hey, he had 50% extra nipple capacity. <laughs> well, he resist. he's got one extra erogenous zone for a man. Well, technically, I guess he could fit one more lady on him than Bond, so... That's true. He went all the way up to 11. <laughs> it, what's also interesting is Alice Cooper, who is not really what I would think of as a musician who would score movies, uh, wrote a version of The Man with the Golden Gun to be the theme song, but it was turned down for what we subsequently got. Uh, but it did release on one of his albums, right? I I didn't read that. Did did he release it finally? Yeah, it's it was released on one of the one of his albums at the time, and he announced that at a concert that it was written for the film, but was rejected mm -hmm. by the producers. Interesting. Yeah, that, I, that would I have been a very interesting choice in in the you know, mid seventies to put an Alice Cooper theme song to this film. Well, if they can do an ex Beatle for. Bond's um, black exploitation film. I guess they could do a heavy metal guy for a Chinese martial artist um, redneck romp through the swamp. <laughs> well, what I found, uh, you know, kind of now getting more into the film, but just talking about openings, this is the second kind of pre title sequence where Roger Moore doesn't even appear uh, other than as a mannequin. Uh, that Scaramanga shoots the fingers off of, but James Bond himself doesn't actually appear in the film, and he didn't appear in the film in Live and Let Die. They showed all the other agents being killed off, but they never actually showed Roger Moore. So it's kind of like, wow, where's uh, when's James got, James Bond going to show up in this film? I don't know if they were still competing with knockoffs of the spy series, and they were trying to differentiate themselves from both the knockoffs and the previous Bond movies. Maybe they thought they would start it off. I don't know if it's more suspenseful, but maybe they just thought they would try something different instead of being a little formulaic. That went to hell the rest of the movie, but maybe that's why they <laughs> tried to start it that way. Yeah, maybe something different for them. You know, I, I you know, when you start the nine films in, they've got to start thinking of how do we distinguish this film a little bit different from the last eight um, and especially from the, the last one, Live and Let Die, which wasn't as well received as um, the previous last Sean Connery film, Diamonds Are Forever, unfortunately. What about uh, gadgets and action sequences, Matt? Well, of course, we had our kung fu fighting. They were fast as lightning. It's, <laughs> it's really... No? Okay. No. No, um, no. <laughs> Uh, I would like to hear more of the song to reminisce. <laughs> well, there was a, uh, let's see, we had a golden gun and golden bullets, which I'm not quite sure would work, but... Because um, gold's a soft metal, right? I mean, it doesn't... Yeah. Yeah, they were shot very accurately, but I got to believe that wouldn't hold up. Um, 
We, we, we need someone nerdier than the three of us to really explore that, I'm afraid. I would um, think that when the bullet came out of the gun that it would be too deformed really to fly through the air with any lethality. Didn't they shoot soft soft metals in those old front-loading muskets? So one reason they were oh. so devastating. I don't know. I don't know. It was the Bronze Age, so who knows? <laughs> I think my favorite gadget in this whole movie for whatever reason, was the uh, the, the Queen Mary shipwreck uh, office complex that MI6 had set up in. I just thought that was really cool. I, I didn't know what they were sh- why they were showing that to us at first, but then when they, they brought them back there and MI6 was in there, what with the high real estate prices and all, that was probably my favorite little lair in this movie. And it was awesome how they made um, everything crooked as if it really was tilted over and just made everything straight retroactive yeah no yeah. that that was a cool a visual effect as well as a good idea for a, somewhat of a gadget in the film we have um the the island lair of scaramanga which i thought was pretty was pretty cool um especially his um green energy um production slash death ray outfit <laughs> that uh, i'm not sure how that all played together but you know he's he's versatile is what he is and um i love the the death into a a a tub of freezing liquid and um you know just kind of that classic over the top bond villains hideout action sequences we had another chase scene that was long (laughs) we had um the kung fu scene which was enjoyable Way out of place in this film. We had a place. For, we had a place for a Bond film. I don't, you know, James. It, it, I don't. I don't know why he had to do kung fu. I think this was the height of Bruce Lee's popularity. Yeah, it was, and that's once again kind of like the black exploitation film of Live and Let Die being used as for profitability and to it show some sort of, uh, I don't know, uh, importance or. Uh, <laughs> making the franchise seem at least hip now for, for its time that now they grabbed onto uh, a Kung Fu element. Well, I'm just glad there wasn't like a um, sorcerer's magic wand in Casino Royale, you know, <laughs> trying to piggyback off Harry Potter at the time. But we had um, the, the couple of scenes of um, in the fun house, the, the opening and closing kind of, I thought that was, I thought that was a, a good, James Bond touch. It, it would have been silly in any other kind of movie, but to have for an eccentric villain to to kind of pull that, I thought it was entertaining. I thought it was a good way to open the movie because I, I it, it drew me in. And um, of course, we had the um, greatest uh, gadget of all. That would be a little man assistant, <laughs> who was probably the best killer out of everybody in this film. It seemed at times. True. But it, it, I don't think they like to be called gadgets. I think they like to be called little people. Oh, okay. Well, I you know you know, and I mean. they do not like it when you throw the gadgets. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Gadget throwing is illegal in many states in the U.S. So, <laughs> well, what about you're going to skip the flying car? Oh, and the flying car with tracking device, of course. I <laughs> I like the the garage was the garage it comes out of is probably a greater gadget than the flying car itself. <laughs> There was a flying car, though. There was a little flying car. The, the, that was probably one of the most impressive things in the film, that stunt jump where they corkscrew that car across the, the river or, I don't know, stream or whatever. It was That's an impressive stunt, considering it was actually done and it's not special effect. Yeah, I thought it was very impressive. I uh, didn't remember that from watching it all the years ago, but um, I thought it was hilarious and very well done. Also... Uh, since we're we're kind of talking about the action scene, which is cramming J.W. Pepper <laughs> into the Asian car chase, <laughs> a real a real stretch. Just putting him in it was a real stretch. Come on, a Southern sheriff involved in a car chase? I mean, this was years ahead of Smokey and the Bandit. What they were ahead of their time. Yeah, I'm sure a lot of Southern crackers love touring Asia. <laughs> Trying to think, what other gadgets are, were there though in the film? The Elodium Q thirty six explosive space modulator. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, little, that's from Bugs uh, Bunny, isn't it? 
what? That's from Bugs Bunny, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It's it from, sounds familiar, but Marvin I couldn't. Marvin the Martian. Vo- Marvin the Martian. But that's what I thought the whole time that uh, they were looking for this little contraption for their solar powered uh, death ray. Hey, what you know, Chris? Uh, M- Matt's already said what his favorite gadget was. The the uh, little person. What was your favorite gadget? <laughs> My favorite gadget in this one, I think it was the plane, and not just the plane, the, the way that they, they connected the pl- the wings to the car, which amused me endlessly. Um, th- I, I like that the most, I think. Hmm. What about your least favorite gadget? Good night. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say no more. All right. I- I'll give you that High one. High maintenance. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Matt, you tell us what your favorite gadget was. What's your least favorite gadget in the film? Least favorite gadget? I, I guess I just got to go with golden bullets. Okay. It's just, it, just, it just doesn't make any sense. All right. No, I'll we, go with We that. need a ballistics expert on this show. All right. I, I am going to disagree with you as far as the fun house. I still think that's one of the weakest, uh, let alone J.W. Pepper, the weakest element of this film. But the fun house is just like... What is this, and you know why? Why is this intimidating in any way, shape, or form to hit men that he hires to come there and test him? I, I don't know. It just made no sense to me. I thought it was ridiculous, and I, I was like, "Ah, eh, that's pointless." And more importantly, it's easily solved. Yeah, just leave the funhouse and climb on the the scaffolding below it. What was the deal with real people as mannequins in the funhouse? Was was there anything symbolic on that? Was there any reason for it? I don't know. And that was kind of what obviously he hadn't killed Bond, but he had a mannequin of Bond. And then the first hitman seemed to recognize one of the uh, wax dummies or whatever as someone that he he had worked with before. And I was wondering, is did Scaramanga actually kill him and then use his likeness in the funhouse? Or is he just using famous people? Or did he stuff them like trophies and kept them in his own... That would make him much more sinister, but Bond was in there and he wasn't dead. So I always took it as it's just a mannequin statue. I I don't know. They looked. My first thought was actors just must be cheaper than than getting wax (laughs) um, sculptures. So I I don't know. Well, that could be. That's true. But also at uh, Mr. Fat's um, house, he had the two sumo wrestlers uh, who were statues that came to life and attacked Bond. True. All right, let's talk about some girls, shall we? If I can find my girl information. <laughs> Four primary Bond girls in this film is the way I categorize them. First and foremost, Mary Goodnight, uh, Britt Eklund, which uh, Matt has already uh, <laughs> made fun of. Or is it Chris who's already made fun of? Uh, I did. Chris has made fun of already in this podcast. Bond actually slept with her eventually at the end, but actually did sleep with her. Then we have uh, Andrea Anders, played by Maude Adams, in her first of three James Bond film appearances. Uh, Bond also slept with her, right in, basically in front of Mary Goodnight. Then there's Seda, the belly dancer, uh, played by Carmen Du Satoy. Bond did not sleep with her. Didn't get a chance. Uh, something got stuck in his throat, so he had to get out of there. And then, of course, uh, probably one of my favorite Bond names, Chu Me. Uh, <laughs> played by Fran Suisse. Uh, I'm going to slaughter this name, but Fran Suisse Terry, which I, I believe she was French, but um, obviously playing Chinese. But great name. And uh, love the idea that she just swims in the pool naked. Bond didn't get a chance to sleep with her yet, but he was well on his way. So, uh, four. With uh, and obviously we have Monty Penny and the the you know what comes with every episode every James Bond film but for James Bond films what did you guys uh, who stands out as your favorite Bond girl in this film as far as performance wise not looks just performance uh I just have to, I have to go with Andrea okay why I thought Good Night was really whiny she just you know had the a, a crazy ex-girlfriend vibe the whole movie. <laughs> and so I, I go with Andrea by default, I think. Because I don't really, the other two don't really measure up to Bond girl status, I think. Yeah, I think uh, Matt said it uh, correctly. It's Andrea by default. I, I didn't think either of these ladies um, were that great. Although Andrea, I think, was 
the better looking of the two. Good night was just whiny and stupid, and I'm just like, there's no way she could be a secret agent. She's she's just there to screw everything up, and no, I just didn't buy her in any way, shape, or form in this film. So Andrea by default. Well, uh, that's going to be three for three because I do think a- Andrea Anders is the the most important of the female characters, if not one of the most important. Uh, of all the characters she's the one that basically sets this all in motion um because she's looking to get out she's the one who sent the bullet it's not uh, scaramanga who sends a bullet she sends the bullet trying to uh entice bond into in basically coming to a sister with that mary goodnight is the comic relief and she's not even i mean she she as you guys kind of said she fumbles along she doesn't assist in any way she's just along for the ride and she does have that element of the uh scary ex-girlfriend who's just tagging along um, she's, I mean, she's no threat to anyone as, as far as a secret agent. And even when she gets captured by Scaramanga, she just goes along with him and starts wearing a bikini and living on the island. I mean, she, she doesn't seem to be trying to assist any in any way until Bond shows up and probably would have lived her life there. Where Andrea Anders was at least moving the plot and had some uh, some development, some level, layers to her character. Although he cannot just look past the fact that Chu Mi, although brief appearance, had a lot of effect on the film. One of the she best... Was, she was probably one of the easiest to look at in this film, that's well, for sure. one of the best James Bond na- names. I mean, up there with Pussy Galore, Chu Mi. Mm-hmm. Watching her was almost like watching scrambled porn in the 80s in that water. <laughs> that's true. Okay, now, the who is the best looking of the four women that we have? I actually, well, I'm going to stick with Andrea. I did think she was, I thought she was very beautiful. Yeah, Andrea was the best looking. Yeah, I'm going to disagree with you there. I I, I go for the blonde, so I, I like Brett Eklund as far as looks, but her character drives me up the wall. So I'll say good night on that one. All right, Bond kills, Chris. Who does Bond kill in this film? And who dies because of something Bond does? And who gets killed in this film and i i already know the answer to some of these questions so i'm kind of curious uh what you think about it well bond literally only killed one person i know one person and, in the uh, entire film and yeah, i i get it i mean this was the reason for the film scaramanga was obsessed with him and wanted to prove what a great killer he was and killing bond was his only obsession and bond had no other choice but to kill scaramanga and because this is a Bond film, not a Scaramanga film, Bond wins. So he was the only one. This is actually, of all of our films so far, this has got the least kills. There's no grand killing montage. Um, in the Kung Fu fight, everybody just gets knocked out by uh, 12-year-old girls. And so this is a pretty sparse one as far as the good guys and the bad guys killing. I, I'm amazed. I, you know, I didn't really pay attention the way Chris did. I'm amazed there weren't more. Yeah. Good night killed the maintenance guy in the liquid helium or whatever that was. And really, she didn't kill him. She just kind of fumbled into knocking him over. Scaramanga killed only four people with four bullets. Uh, and let's see, were all of them in the head? I think two were in the head, two were in the chest. Um, that uh, Don Corleone guy was killed at the beginning, the gangster. He killed Gibson outside of the strip club. He killed Mr. Fat at his, I don't know if that was his house or his Is lair. It, yeah, and I think then, it was his lair. His lair. And then he killed Andrea Anders in um, that kickboxing arena. So that was all the killing. Yeah, literally five or no six people killed total in this film, which mm-hmm. Bond usually does by himself in a film before breakfast. Yeah. yeah, out of all of our villains that we've seen in all these movies, the probably the only person who had well, not the only the person who had the best chance of killing Bond was Nick Knack when he was on that um, when, when he was at Mister Fat's house on on that bench, and Mister Fat said stop because. Nick Knack wouldn't have hesitated to put that spear in his chest. So I think that Nick, that that's why I think that Nick, Nick Knack was probably the most ruthless of the, the people in this film. 
I, you know, I kind of wonder if, if the, that was done on purpose for the fact that you, the big bad in this film is a hired assassin, a you know ruthless killer, which James Bond is supposed to be, and that they had to kind of distinguish what he did compared to what James Bond does. Is that you know, Bond gives a nice speech about what he does is for you know Queen and country, and it's not done for kicks or for money. But I, I kind of wonder if they wrote that in the story that he's not just randomly killing people, random henchmen or people who may be coming after him for whatever reason in this film and made it so that the only person he killed is the killer. That could very well be. All right. Oh, let's talk about the villains. uh, Four villains in this film. Obviously, Scaramanga is the primary villain uh, played by Christopher Lee, uh, Count Dooku long before uh, in the star Wars films. Um, even the original Star Wars films. Uh, interesting, almost played by Jack Palance, and it is uh, he's widely considered to be one of the best Bond films ever, although this is widely considered one of the bo- worst Bond films ever. What did you guys think of Scaramanga? Why the three nipples? Just... I don't I know. I mean, uh, that way I guess it was his unique thing, so Bond could copy it, but it seemed, um, for lack of a better word, uh, superfluous. <laughs> to me well you get really qu- it's a kind of a question on your intelligence gathering at that we, we know nothing about this man we had no idea what it looks like except for he has three nipples how did yeah. you come across that that little tidbit of information yeah how many him and bond sleep in the same pool <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i thought he was good though overall I, he he didn't feel um particularly dangerous to me and that might have been more of a directing thing than than an acting performance thing or maybe a writing thing but but he was he was okay i just not i I wouldn't put him up there as one of my favorites but he is he really that dangerous i mean uh, looking back at it he's i know he's supposed to be this hired assassin this cold-blooded killer but he has multiple opportunities to kill bond and he doesn't um, because he respects Bond, you know, he respects him as for what he does, and he's not paid to kill him, even though Bond's chasing after him, and they're going after the same thing, and that makes him kind of a very different Bond villain for me. It's that it's his is not driven by, uh, you know, revenge or motivation or motivated by some, you know, all power. I'm going to take over the world type of bullshit. It's it, it, you know, this is just about money to him, and he's very very clinical and very cold that that's why the the kind of like the final act of the film where it's like oh we're going to take each other on mano mano y mano seems kind of a change in his character that he didn't need to do that didn't seem consistent with the way they'd written him to that point true i i think that's that's interesting i um i don't know i i I do appreciate the the more ambitious villains though i will say the take over the world villains, I kind of like them. They or, get, or they, bl- they blur together. <laughs> the mass destruction villains too. Yeah. For me, whenever I see uh, Christopher Lee in a film, I feel that I don't know if it's just his acting style, if or if it's his personality coming through. Like Harrison Ford, you know, is always going to have a grumpy disposition in all of his movies and I, I just don't know if it's his personality but Christopher Lee always comes off as an amoral person in, in all of his films and I thought that Scaramanga was very much an amoral character and that's why he acted how he did he he didn't really think that um, what he was doing was wrong as um, Bond chastised him for uh, killing for money where his was for duty. And um, I, I don't think Scaramanga looked at the world that way as in right or wrong. It's just as this is how it how it is. And um, he envied the position Bond was in and for in order for him to be uh, that prestigious of a person, he had to take out the number one person. So I, I just saw Scaramanga as a very amoral character. What about uh, Nick Knack? Uh, obviously, you've kind of expressed that he's probably the best killer in the entire film already. But uh, I, I'm not going to, you know, I try to pronounce the the, the actor's name, but uh, obviously known as Tattoo on the fa- Fantasy Island, Hervé Villachay. Thank you. 
Uh, what did you guys think of him? Now, this film I had not seen probably since the mid '80s. It's been so long, and uh, is so long that I didn't think I had even seen it. But as soon as I saw Hervé, um, it, it all came back to me, and he is the main thing from this film that I've always remembered. I didn't even remember the redneck cop in this at all. But, uh, I mean, he in many ways is, is the the link from for everybody in this film, almost the glue of this film, because he is the one consistent factor in this as the driving force. He, he is Scaramanga's servant. He's the guy who's always making it seem as if the the assassins are he's on the assassin side when he's only on Scaramanga side and he's the driving force bringing everything together I really liked him I thought that I thought the character was fun the the he pulled it off really well I liked that he was the kind of a practical cold-hearted one that wanted a spear bond so I thought he's one of the my favorite bond characters characters to date i thought he he kind of stole the show whenever he was around yeah i do think he falls in line with it as far as it uh, a very uh, uh interesting side you know sidekick henchman of some sort that he uh he's very different from kind of the uh odd jobs or uh red grants uh, of the film uh, uh the previous films that it, he's not physically imposing, but he's got a very sinister streak about him. That, and especially when he's fighting Bond at the end, it's, which is still done for comic relief, but uh, Bond seems to having, be having difficulty trying to contain Nick Knack till he gets him into the suitcase. So, I, you know, I don't, I don't think he's, I, you know, he, he's an interesting character. I, I like him in the film. I think he serves a purpose, uh, but. You know, I don't. I don't think he's one of the greatest henchmen. He's just very memorable, and that's primarily because of his size. He's very, very different. Now, this is widely panned as the worst of the Roger Moore films by many. I will disagree with that, but we'll get to that. Um, and w- considered one of the worst of the James Bond films in the series. But what does work about this film? I like. I like some of the sets. And just some of the locales. I like the the island lair. Pretty much always works for me. I liked Nick Knack. I thought that character was really good. So I, I thought so. You know, some of the the more some of the stuff I usually like the the scenes, the sets, all that stuff. Those worked for me in this one. I'll leave it at that. I'll, I'll save the rest for <laughs> what you're gonna ask next. Well, what worked for me? Uh, I think the character Nick Knack. Um, I did like the kickboxing scene a lot. The car flip, which we uh, talked about, I thought was was great. Um, no Kick, computers. Kickboxing when they're at the arena and Andre Anders is killed? or the- Yeah, that's see, not, not the kung fu fighting. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, when they're at the arena, that I think that scene, for some reason, has stuck in my mind from the first time I saw it. And it it's one of my earliest visions of Bond, so I've I've always liked that scene. And then I do like I do like the theme of Scaramanga as this I guess you could say obsessed fan looking to take the place of Bond by killing Bond. I do like that that notion, and I think it's kind of overdue. I don't I think it could have been done earlier than the tenth into the series. Ninth. Ninth into the film series, I, I will agree with you that that's my primary thing that I like about this film is it's very different from the previous eight films and that there is no real big bad going to take over the world. Spectre is nowhere to be seen. Blofeld's nowhere to be seen. It is kind of just Bond taking on one guy, and 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 I think Christopher Lee is good in the role. I I, I like him as that. I have a hard time imagining jack palance play this role just he would he seems very out of place and maybe i'm just pigeon pigeonholing him as kind of like uh city slickers and shane so uh it just it you know maybe unfair to him as an actor but it just didn't seem like the perfect role for him i i, I like all the characters that are involved with it with the exception of jw 
J.W. Pepper, who I just, I hated him in the last film and I hate him in this film. I just don't think he does anything to move the plot. And I think it's just done for comic relief and, and it's not that funny, but I, you know, I do like this film. I, I do not think this is one of the worst in the James Bond franchise or the Roger Moore franchise. I, I, this is one of the first two films I saw from, when I was introduced to James Bond, the first film was you only live twice. And the second film on HBO that night was this film. And so I got introduced to two films back to back and I, maybe I romanticize it, but I like this film. I, this is probably my third favorite Roger Moore film. What? Okay. Uh, I know Matt's apparently been keying up for this. What doesn't work about this film, Matt? Well, I should, what I should have added that does work now that I think about it this way is I, I do like um, Scaramanga's motivations and all of that. But again, the, just kind of how formulaic it, it gets, the overly long car chase, the uh, villain coming in for one last attempt to kill Bond at the end. I felt like they're just kind of falling back on some of these things and it, gets, it feels lazy and it feels like I've seen it all five or more times. So, so I think I think that that was most of it was just that I, I felt like, you know, I'd seen this movie too many times at some points. Well, and that's interesting because I one of the reasons I like this is because it breaks the formula. You know that there's it's very different in many regards. It does have the long car chase. You know, it does have the Bond girls, but he doesn't kill as many people. He seems to be trying to piece together a puzzle more so than some of the other ones. Uh, other Bond films, I, I don't think it. I, I disagree with you there. I think it doesn't follow a formula, and that's why it does ultimately work for me. But okay, but what what ultimately do you think? What are the elements that don't work in this film besides J.W. Pepper? I think we're all in agreement right there. Yeah, I think that's unanimous. Well, for me, the scenes, the scenes with Goodnight at, at times, I feel like I was watching The Love Boat from the seventies. <laughs> You know, it was like a sunset. I, f- I forget what scene it was, but there was like a sunset and it was close up on their face. I'm like, dude, just ask her for a nightcap and go back to your cabin. And um, I, I, that scene took me out. Um, I thought Money Penny looked very tired in this film, was uninspiring. There's no, I didn't really see a whole lot of chemistry between her and Bond in this film. I think that the humor, when it worked in this film, was good. But for the vast majority of it felt extremely flat. There were a lot of scenes that just didn't fit. That, uh, like the, the the karate scene that was thrown in for for no real reason other than uh, we had to get a um, we had to capitalize on the trend of the day. But it, it went, so when the humor was good, it was good. But there was just too many. They tried too hard with the humor, I thought, in this one. Uh, well, I'll agree with you in that, that the humor, when it worked, was okay, was good. But, like, Bond swallowing the the bullet at the beginning of the film and having to go get X-Lax or whatever to, you know, basically shit it out, I thought was pretty lowbrow. Uh, even his comment of almost, you don't know what I had to go through to get that. Um, you know, the whole... J.W. Pepper scene just is just painful for me to watch. Although it's got one of the greatest, you know, film stunts I've ever seen in the film with the car jump. It, you know, it just it's bookended by J.W. Pepper and his racist rants throughout the entire film. And he does, and he doesn't have to be there. He's, he's got no point to be there other than to put someone in the car for Bond to talk to. And then, uh, you know, Bre- uh, Brett Eklund, um, Good Night is just an annoying character that doesn't really serve any purpose. She's just. She's just there to hang on Bond's arm and look good. And that I, I hate when the Bond women don't really don't do anything to move the plot or have any importance. And even his Chinese um, counterpart there, um, what was the guy's name? The one who uh, was the uncle or the of the, the two girls. He didn't even really seem to need to be in this film either. No, he didn't. Other than there's a couple of scenes where he's trying to help bond but he never actually does anything to help bond other than bring the two teenage girls over to kick everyone's ass so and bond still would have stepped those two yeah he probably would have it's i think it's legal over there so he's in thailand 
<laughs> yeah, there you go. Well, let's uh, let's close it out. What, not that we're putting it where we would rank exactly at this point in time, but out of nine films, would you put it in your top half or in your bottom half of the the Bond series that, of the films we've seen so far? Of the films we've seen so far, I would put it probably in the middle. I even though I was talking, well, even though I have problems with this film, I think it is entertaining. Um, Christopher, the Christopher Lee and Roger Moore relationship in this film works for me. I think the film's strengths outweigh its weaknesses. I do not consider this to be one of the worst Bond films, and I don't consider it to be one of the worst Roger Moore films. So I overall like this film. It's a, it's in the top half. Wow, I'm surprised with that statement. No, I mean, I, I, it doesn't have to be a, a perfect movie, but it's not... It, it's better than than a good chunk of the ones we've seen. It is not up there with with my favorite ones, but I put it in the lower half of the top. Well, I've already kind of telegraphed my punch, but yeah, this is uh, of the films we've seen. I definitely would put this in the top half. It's it's not up there with Doctor No, Goldfinger, From Russia with Love, but I find it a better film and more entertaining film than. Uh, Diamonds Are Forever, Honor Majesty's Secret Service, it, pretty much even a Thunderball. Um, I, I think those are lesser films than this. It, it has its faults, and there are some really glaring faults that could easily have been corrected, and I think this would have been a tighter, smarter, better film. But I think the, the film was made, uh, in, in considering interesting to think that in 1974 there was an energy crisis and this film was being somewhat topical about trying to you know adapt solar energy to to for energy production as well as in this case potentially a laser weapon um because every bond film needs some sort of gadget but it's 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 still as relevant then as or today as it was then is that, the, you know, this is technology and the idea of it could still be something that could be adapt, could have been adapted to a bond film today and done pretty well. So it, it, it doesn't seem to be dated as much as say live and let die, which we just saw. And, and I think this is a better film than live and let die, but uh, where that seems a very, a product of the early seventies and could not be placed in any other time frame. Scaramanga was kind of the first Bond villain to go green. Yes, he was. And, and he did that by hiring uh, short help, who didn't eat as much. They work for less. Yeah. Because, you know, getting food on the island is a real pain in the ass. <laughs> All right, that does it for this month's review of The Man with a Golden Gun. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little monthly podcast. If you had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Movie House Memories or on Twitter at MH Memories. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts such as Mail Bonding or Movie House Memories or Lunchtime Movie Review. Additionally, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you download us off iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those formats. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive. We read those over and over again, but we appreciate any feedback that we get from any listeners of the show. That is it for this episode of Mail Bonding. Until next time when we review The Spy Who Loved Me, which is one of the best Roger Moore films, in my opinion. Spoiler uh, alert. Yeah. Uh, I'm Patrick. I'm Chris going to the crow's nest to get my Frenchie down. And I'm Matt. And we'll see you next time at our house. This podcast is not endorsed by Eon Productions and Sony Pictures Home Entertainment and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. James Bond and the Man with the Golden Gun, all names and sounds of James Bond and the Man with the Golden Gun characters, and any other James Bond and the Man with the Golden Gun related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Eon Productions and Sony Pictures Home Entertainment or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of Movie House Memories and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.